am indeed. Um, my name is Maria Carlton. I'm the Devices Technical Assessment Manager in the HPRA. My colleague Dr. McAleenan wasn't able to come here today, fortunately, he was called away at short notice. But um, what I hope to be able to, ta to bring you through today is um, the area of clinical investigations in devices, and I'll just try and see if I can get that on yep. the screen here. Um, just in terms of, of wh while we're getting that, um, my background is, uh, just to give you an idea, I'm an engineer. Um, I worked in industry in cardiology, um, um, also in dialysis, I have to try and remember what I've done in the past, and also in the area of grafts. Um, I've been in the uh, IMB slash HPRA for, for a number of years and my team work on uh, clinical investigation review and approval from the technical point of view. Um, we look at classification, we look at notified bodies, we look at market surveillance. So um, we, we do quite a lot of, of, of things in the space of medical devices. Yeah. Sorry, is, is not there, is it not? I, I might as well start because I sort of know what I, I, I want to talk to you about today. Um, so uh, in terms of medical devices, um, as, as our previous speaker said, there is a large manufacturing presence here in Ireland. Um, just a, the difference between medicinal products and, and, and medical devices is the, the various different, uh, there's 500,000 different types of medical devices that are out there, which is significantly different from the, the number of medicinal products you have. So from our point of view, um, overseeing them and reviewing them, and from your point of view, uh, understanding the complexity of them is something that we get a lot of questions about um, uh, over, over time. So what we do in the HPRA is, is in the medical device space, we, uh, as I said, we regulate uh, medical devices through three main directives. Um, there is a, a directive for general medical devices, for in vitro diagnostic devices and for active implantable devices. And it's through these three uh, directives that we uh, apply the legislation. Um, we have a number of, of uh, other directives which helps in our task. Just to let you know that our regulations are changing, um, they're undergoing review at the moment in the Latvian presidency. We're hoping that uh, the regulations will be uh, approved through Parliament at some stage this year, which will mean there'll be a, a new medical device regulation sometime in the near future. And it's hoped that through these uh, new regulations there will be some elements of the clinical trial regulation, which you heard mention of today, will also be uh, in with our regulations. Um, one element which we don't have currently, which we have through the standard, but not, um, for instance, in the area of GCP inspections for devices, that may come through with, uh, with the new regulations. We also hope to have um, a process similar to the vol voluntary harmonisation process, the VHP, which is there for medicinal products as well. We hope to have that too. Another area which you have already in the area of, of clinical trials is that we hope to have um, also uh, an increased transparency on the uh, medical device uh, investigations that are happening at the moment, um, and that is through our UDMA database. What I'm going to talk about no now more is general medical devices. So for general medical devices we have four main risk categories. So there's those um, low risk class 1 devices which are self-declared, which we maintain in a register. We have class 2A and class 2B devices, which are those which are, um, class, example of a class 2A device would be a, a contact lens, which would be um, not for intact skin, but a uh, broken skin or, uh, for example, in the eye. Um, class 2B devices would be um, your peripheral uh, bare metal stents that you would see, so they would be implants in the peripheral regions. And class 3 devices are those, um, for instance, um, which would be in the... Uh, the central nervous system or the cardiovascular system, your, uh, your um, drug eluting stents, your orthopaedic hips, um, and etc. etc. So, so they're the different types of classes of device which you have. The reason that classification is something that I'm bringing up uh, to you is it's a question we get oftentimes when people say to us um, as an investigator or a sponsor or, or clinical innovations in general is, what class is my device? And there is lots of uh, helpful documents out there which will give you guidance in what we call med devs. And the reason why it's important to know the classification of your device, it depends on 
what level of documentation you need to support the device and the device type because those classes are based on risk of device. Obviously your class one being your lower risk and your class three being your higher risk. So just it, it gives you an idea of why they're classified that way. It's a risk based um, classification. Um, so, uh, and then a uh, couple of the principles in the legislation are um, uh, essential requirements. We have uh, in the annexes of our directives essential requirements which uh, allow you to, uh, as a manufacturer or, or as um, uh, somebody who's looking at a prototype, um, you need to have a look at certain areas so that you can um, ensure that the product is safe to use. Great. Right. So you, you should have this, but I'll, I'll fast forward through the first couple of slides. So, um, mission statement, I'll let you peruse that at your leisure. Um, I uh, talked a little bit about our role in uh, devices and that, that gives you an idea of the scope of what we do. Um, and the legislation, I just, it's just there for you to go back and I'm not going to do an exam on this later on. It's, uh, there's quite a number of directives and, and statutory instruments um, for covering devices. Just to let you know that, you know, if there is, um, if you're looking at a prototypes were mentioned today or devices, that's not covered under the, uh, the clinical trials um, legislation. So, you know, if you have a new device or a new prototype, you, um, which is to be brought for commercialization, that would, we would expect to see that under the clinical investigation route. So um, this just gives you an idea. When you see a device and you see a CE mark on it, um, which means that it can be used within the European community, um, there is a lot of other elements, obviously, that uh, make up the, uh, the, the support of data that required for that CE mark. And that is what I've talked about, classification, uh, essential requirements. I'm going to talk a little bit about clinical evaluation now, which is um, a clinical investigation is a subset of that. And the uh, other elements which I won't talk about today is about conformity assessment and quality management systems, and they're really to do with what the manufacturer of a medical device will get into. So I mentioned uh, essential requirements, they're uh, elements which uh, are need to be supported to, pro to show the performance and safety of a device. And we, we talked about classification, I'll just skip through these, that just gives you a, a visual picture of some of the devices there. And again, this is the, the approach when you're looking at classification of a device um, supporting the, the, the risk qualification classification. So just quickly on to clinical evaluation. Um, clinical evaluation in the context of devices really is the uh, assessment of clinical data. And it's looking at the evaluation of the side effects and the acceptability of the benefit risk ratio. So um, assessment of clinical data uh, is part of uh, clinical evaluation and every device requires clinical evaluation. Now, clinical evaluation can mean a number of things. Oops, I just... So, clinical evaluation for devices can be based, to a certain extent, on uh, equivalence between devices. Um, and, but also, you would need to have the support of information for essential requirements. Where that's not available, uh, that's where clinical investigations are required. Where um, you have a completely new device, uh, different intended use, etc., etc. I'll go into that in more detail now. And clinical evaluation also can be a combination of um, the, 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 uh, the scientific literature route plus clinical investigations. So just in terms, this is the definition here of clinical investigation. It is uh, fairly similar on a par to clinical study. It's just a clinical trial, but it's, it's just what we call it under the legislation. Um, there are, these are the annexes in the uh, directives uh, relating to clinical investigations. And one very important standard in the area is 14155, and that really is dealing with uh, good clinical practice for medical devices, and that's really where the role of the investigator, the sponsor, and all the uh, relevant elements are outlined in there. It's a, it's a worthwhile document to have if you're in this space. So clinical investigations, just where would you involve us in clinical investigations? So there are a number here where I mentioned where it's a completely new device, um, where... Uh, you're using new materials, where you're using a new intended use for uh, an existing device, where it's in a different location. Um, so in all of those areas, um, clinical, clinical investigation may be uh, considered. Where, um, 
Where we wouldn't generally be involved is where it's an early clinical or academic research with no regulatory purpose, where there is no intent of bringing this to market. There's no intent of, of, of uh, regulatory uh, approval through CE mark. There's no intent of that. So that's where we wouldn't expect to be involved or where it's an existing uh, uh, CE mark device. So you have a device already there on the market and it's being used with its intended purpose and um, it's, it's carried out by the manufacturer to get further information or by the sponsor or investigator to get further information, but it's already been used where it should be under the intended use of the device. And obviously both competent authority ourselves and the HPRA and ethics committee are required. Um, so we, um, I've just been asked a question earlier on about, um, about a clinical investigation. Because of the complexity and the variation in devices and the th hundreds of thousands of devices that are out there, we do um, uh, suggest a pre-submission meeting with ourselves because um, we have found that if, if we get a, a, a submission cold, a lot of the times we can uh, deal with some of those questions through a pre-submission meeting. We have regular pre-submission meetings with people all the time and it's really to go through what we would expect, what we'd expect to be submitted um, and what issues you may uh, come across and the timelines with our process. So when you get to submission, um, costs there are no, just wanted to highlight, we've changed to the similar, um, previously we did have costs for academic and investigators uh, uh, trials, or investigations, I'm saying it myself now. Um, but uh, at the moment when there's no commercialisation grant and it's coming through academia, um, we, don't, uh, we don't charge for those. Again, uh, as we mentioned, there's a parallel review. Um, uh, previously, we would have, even before we commenced the review, we would have had looked for uh, ethics committee before starting our review, but now it's in parallel. Obviously, it's part of the uh, letter of no objection or authorization that uh, ethics committee has to be um, available at the same time. So in terms of our actual um, our process, we um, have uh, the same cutoff dates as there are in the uh, clinical trials. It's the I think it's the first second Tuesday of every month. Um, we uh, do initial validation of the data to make sure that everything's there. Um, we have an application form which is available on our website, and um, very similar items are required. Uh, uh, EC opinion, uh, that's, as I said, that can be in parallel. Insurance, I was very delighted to hear somebody talk about insurance. Oftentimes people forget to see if there are, are insurance for medical devices and to make sure, because you know there has been a lot of uh, litigation in the area. You'd be familiar with the, the HIPS and the PIPS crisis that we've had in our, uh, in, under the medical devices over the last while. So it's very important that the area of insurance is looked at. Um, obviously labelling uh, instructions uh, and statements to do with uh, any medical devices that uh, would incorporate animal tissues or blood derivatives. So that's, uh, we have a day 60 process similar to the clinical trials and this once it's passed validation is on to the, the day one. Udemed is our uh, clinical investigation and our portal for medical devices where our information is um, uploaded um, and this is a European uh, a uh, competent authority um, portal where our colleagues can have a look at this. Our vigilance uh, data is all, also up on this and some other information about product certificates etc are available on Udemy. So just in terms of, this is a very long list, I just want to give you a flavour um, of what's required. I'm not going to go through each of these items but um, this is sort of what we do ask for um, and there's two lists here which I'm going to talk about. Um, one is our clinical investigator brochure information that we look for and um, you can see the stars. There's, there's, um, uh, the reason I'm highlighting this is because the areas of benefit risk analysis and also the summary of testing that has happened um, prior to submission is very important to us. We obviously have to ensure that the, the product is, is safe for use and um, while uh, we appreciate there may have been um, uh, previous uh, clinical assessment, oftentimes what we find missing is the assessment of the de design of the device, the materials, the biocompatibility, the sterilisation. So we often find that this isn't submitted when, when we see it and this is one area that we, we have to highlight to people. Um, the other uh, main documents that we look for are the clinical investigation plan, which you obviously are familiar with those, and um, just some of the areas that we, we find uh, we have to go back with questions on are in the area of um, 
with the number of subjects and duration of the study, um, uh, the follow-up period frequently um, we have to ask questions on that and the, uh, the endpoints um, as well and the, uh, what you would expect from the performance and the, and the, uh, from, the, from the trial or the investigation design. Um, SAE reporting, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, they're very similar to what we've heard today, but just device specific. So I'll just uh, quickly go through this. Um, we have an initial review, day 1 to 30, and these are the areas that we look at, as I said, uh, through our day 1 to 30. One thing I would say to you, that it's very important that design of the device is frozen and that it's not continued to be iterated because we would expect that whatever is submitted to us um, is what will be in the clinical investigation when it starts. Um, and this is the, the, the balance between an early prototype and something that you're trying to continue to develop. Um, we would expect that at some stage there is a freeze and that what we see is, is the frozen design. And obviously if that has to change based on feedback through the clinical investigation, that an amendment should be submitted to us to show where the design um, has had to change to um, reflect needs, um, uh, clinical needs maybe during the investigation. So um, at day 30 uh, to 40, we've sent our questions back and um, uh, this, the sponsor uh, has, has an opportunity to review our questions. This is where we get clock stops oftentimes. Um, and this is really uh, where we would say that we have seen where devices have been submitted to us maybe too early because uh, the sponsor may have to return and do significant uh, testing, which they hadn't uh, maybe not looked at some of the areas of essential requirements that need to be covered, and they had to go back and maybe repeat biocompatibility testing or, or do it in the first place, maybe. Um, and uh, this is something that may take more than maybe what we'd expect a clock stop to be, two, two or three months maximum, really. So once we have reviewed the responses, then it goes to Management Committee for review and there you would receive your letter of no objection, authorisation or objection. And um, we update UDMED with the, uh, the outcome. And then um, once there's no objection, then you uh, get into the SA reporting, the status update, etc. If there is an objection, obviously there is a chance to appeal. So just in terms of SAEs, we've talked about it today already, and just in terms of uh, the timelines for devices are slightly different. That may change, as I said, with the regulations. It may We may come more in line with what's, what's there for medicinal products. Um, obviously, any serious adverse events would have to be reported to ourselves. And we do ask for summary reports as well um, on a monthly or quarterly basis based on the risk of the device. So here is um, the, uh, some elements of the definition. There is an actual very good MedDev, um, MedDev 27.3, which specifically talks about the detail of the, what uh, uh, constitutes serious adverse event and other reportable events. So just taking a, a highlight here, and at the end of my talk, there's a list of relevant uh, documents where you'll find more details. So, um, so obviously, if there's a risk of, of death, serious injury, illness, or if there is a prolonged hospitalisation, etc., we would expect a report on that. And any other report events in three days or seven days. There's another uh, timeline in there. Um, it says immediate, uh, immediate to two days. We would appreciate as soon as possible. There's also another timeline there for the investigation to sponsor reporting, which is three days. But obviously, if it's very serious, as soon as you can, really, we would appreciate it. Um, just to give you an idea, we traditionally have had a very small number of clinical investigations. Um, we have been more involved in trying to um, uh, encourage clinical investigations, encourage innovation in Ireland. We have a huge amount, uh, 8 to 10 was mentioned, I believe there's 13 to 15, um, there's 8 billion um, worth of export, fr export from, the, um, from Ireland in the area of medical devices. So there is a huge amount of potential in Ireland, but we, we, a lot of the clinical investigations are actually happening in, in other countries in Europe. So um, we, we have had very low numbers, but last year now we would have had 12 applications, 10 of which were approved, um, and uh, we had amendments obviously to do with those. They were in the area of ophthalmic, respiratory, uh, low risk uh, oncology devices, um, also in cardiology areas, so uh, also software as well. So, um, you know, there are some really good, innovative, and, and excellent devices which will help patients in the future, which we are seeing, and we hope to see more of those in the future. 
in terms of our numbers and stats, um, we, we do um, tend to uh, achieve the 60 day timeline and we've even uh, within plus or minus 10 percent we've even uh, for for those devices where we see that um, we can accelerate we do but I mean that's you know there is we do need to do the pre the review and and um, it really will depend on what uh, the questions are the timeline like so a lot of the the time is actually where it takes longer it's out of our control it's where it's gone back to the sponsor and they're preparing responses to us so that's really where if there is a, a longer time frame it's more to do with the uh, uh, questions so these are um, some of the, the principal uh, uh, guidances in the area and I would hope that if there's any questions you have to have a look here and see if they can uh, answer any of your questions and if not we, we would be open to talking to you about it. As I said um, from our point of view uh, uh, in, you know, to try and um, help in the area of clinical in innovation of medical devices we would appreciate your feedback into what type of guidance in addition to this is necessary for innovators in the field um, as, as we do get a lot of questions and um, we would like to see where you would see where um, you, you need to guide further guidance from ourselves in this area. So uh, thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Bria. Thank you for coping with the, it's okay. the lack of slides. So apologies again for that. Uh, are there any questions for Marie? We've got a few, few minutes. Yes. Um, now that's that's uh, my, Dr. Breslin is here as well, so I'm sure she she can talk after. Maybe I say it really depends on the principal purpose of it. If the principal purpose is the delivery of the medicinal product, then it's primarily medicinal product with um, with the device. It really depends. Um, when it is classified as a device, is when the medicinal product is ancillary. So if you think of, for example, a stent where you would have um, an ancillary, the drug would be ancillary to the function of the scaffold. So it's really where it's ancillary, it would be classified as a device. If the primary purpose of the patch is delivery of, of the medicinal product, then it would be a medicinal product. It would, would you concur, Elaine? Yeah. yeah, so it really is where it falls. If you have, for instance, if, um, if the actual patch itself is, is what's healing, then it would be a medical device. If there is a medicinal product which is actually doing the healing, then and the patch is just a delivery mechanism. So you really have to see what is the principal purpose of the device. And we have had concurrent, um, both concurrent investigations and trials where you will have a new medicinal product um, and a, a new um, device. So you, you can have that concurrently as well. So. Um, you would need approval for both um, and it's important and, and this is something we are saying as well it's important for a clinical trial that when you have a medical device that it is within its intended purpose so if you're using a medical device um, and it is um, let's say it has a, a, a specific purpose that if you are uh, using it in conjunction with a, a medicinal product that the intended purpose of the device also covers that so you know um, when you're looking at trials it's important that the device that you use um, also matches with the intended purpose of the of the clinical trial. Any other questions? Um, um, for standalone software, can you say a little bit about <laughs> what determines uh, what what which standalone software ends up being reviewed by the HPRA? Standalone software is something that we're getting a lot of questions at the moment, and we're actually developing guidance in the area. I was just looking at a project plan for that at the moment. Standalone software, there is an actual full uh, med dev guidance on that about uh, what constitutes standalone software. Uh, and maybe if, if it would be useful, I can, I can circulate that link to the group. <coughs> but in terms of, um, it's, it's, it's really where it's controlling. Um, you know, what's important, for example, is if you have a device but where it's controlled by another piece of software and where it's been influenced by another piece of software, that software in itself uh, is an accessory to device, which means it's also a device. So um, really the, the, the main principle to look at for standalone software is, is if it itself has a medical purpose to diagnosing or if it is influencing another medical device and, or controlling it. So we're getting a lot of questions about this and they are, we're, there is a, an actual proper um, uh, decision tree 
for that. And as I said, we can send that around. But there's a lot of questions from um, many areas about it. And that's why we're actually looking at doing a project in this area and um, developing further guidance. So if you have any specific questions, I can, I can come back to you on that. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you.